Welcome to Educational Alpha. I'm Bill Kelly, CEO of Kai Association, and your host, bringing you on the ground conversations with business leaders, educators, and industry colleagues from around the globe. Educational Alpha is sponsored by iCapital, the financial technology company with the mission to power the world's alternative investment marketplace. Part innovator, part educator, and part navigator of the alternatives industry iCapital offers intuitive, scalable digital solutions that have transformed how private market and hedge fund investments are bought and sold. With iCapital, financial advisors, wealth managers, and asset managers around the world now have access to everything they need to deliver the return and diversification potential of alternatives to high net worth investors. To learn more, visit iCapital.com. In today's episode, Jane Abatanta, founder and CEO of Percival Associates, a leadership and communications coaching company for the asset management industry, shares her insights and experiences working with institutional and wealth managers. The discussion explores the changing landscape of the asset management industry, particularly regarding gender diversity and the transition of wealth from institutions to individuals. Jane sheds light on her role in helping clients improve their communication strategies and effectively overcome challenges in conveying their investment processes. This episode is filled with valuable insights and perspectives on navigating the evolving world of asset management. Listen in. Jane Abitata, welcome to Educational Alpha. Thank you. It's great to be here with you. It's a pleasure to see you. It's been a while. And actually, now now I think about it, I'm not even sure if we've met in person, have we? I don't think we have. And that just occurred to me. I thought that we had. And I think the platform where we came together was, I think, your alma mater, University of Delaware. And I know. I still feel a little guilty about that. (laughs) I'm kind of looping you into that. (laughs) No. So I forget. Somebody did literally loop me in. Because I think one of the young students asked me to do a guest lecture, and I was happy I know, to do wonderful. that, especially during COVID. It's easy to do. And then they asked me to join the advisory board, and I've gone to some of their forums on campus. And I always come away dealing with this younger cohort, feeling more energized, more optimistic about the future. We have some challenges, clearly. Yes, and gender diversity is one of them. We're going to get into that, I think, in the course of the next half hour. But, but maybe if you could just introduce Jane to the audience as a starting point. Sure. Well, as you said, my name is Jane Abitanta, and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Percival Associates, and I am a leadership and communications coach to the asset management industry. And I've started this business in 1996 after spending more years than I really want to discuss in the asset management business. So I really grew up working for Citi at the beginning and small cap growth, but big institution and then evolved through the money management business for wealth management as it was just starting. Spent some years at Bessemer Trust where they taught me everything I know about wealth management, which was a lot for them to teach me. And then I spent nine minutes at Chase Manhattan Bank in the wealth management division there, but that was right before they merged with Chemical. And I started Percival in 96 because I recognized that there were a lot of people starting money management firms who knew a lot about managing money but not a whole lot about finding, getting, and keeping clients. And that was the beginning. And Percival has continued to grow, and my clients have continued to grow ever since. I'm a very lucky woman. Well, it sounds like a very interesting platform, maybe at the right point in time, because not only knowing how to tell your story and being able to be a value add to your clients, this transition of the upper echelon of these wealth management shops and these RIAs and and even in some of the institutional shops as well. And if you look at the RIAs, we can focus on that for a moment, even though it might be out of the direct wheelhouse of where you travel. But I've seen some of the stats. The average age is in the mid-60s, white males for the most part. The client base is getting more and more diverse. So they're looking to transition the business and the next generation may or may not want them. So there's a lot going on in this space. And I don't know if that gets into being able to communicate where you can add value. And and this might be the intersection of a few different things that interest you. But but maybe start, who is your client base? Is it institutional managers, wealth managers, a little bit of both? 
a little bit of both, mostly institutional managers and many of whom have created wealth management businesses. And so my experience on the wealth management side has come in pretty handy of late because I have so many of my large public company clients, asset managers who have started very successful businesses. And I think it's, again, the collision of a couple of trends where if you look at who controls the global AUM pie, it's been the institutions for most of your career and mine, but we're not minting any new sovereign wealth funds to find benefit plans. And now the dominant holder is the individual. I think they have 51, 52% of the pie and that's growing. And certainly in 2022, the 60-40 model that defined diversification for most of my generation, my parents' generation, didn't work for at least one year. It's kind of come back a little bit. But the concept of greater diversification, greater access to alts, that's alive and well. And I'm sure you have a lot of traditional managers that now are moving to the wealth space, but also thinking about how they can both acquire or home grow or distribute alternative investment products. And it is a very different breed. Absolutely. It's a very different breed. What's been encouraging to see because I've spent so many years in this space and asset management broadly, and your description of who's managing the money, the 60-year-old white guy in the world, hasn't changed at all through my career. But that does seem to be changing as the democratization of alts can, starts to happen now. And that's really interesting and exciting from my perspective. And we are, I think, doing a better job of, I'm not going to say growing, because I'm not sure we've gotten there yet, but grooming younger people to assume responsibility for the relationships in these wealth management firms. That's exciting to me too, because for years we were buying and selling those people and we weren't really growing them. And that seems to be changing a bit. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing that at the same time as alts are being given and directed towards at least the high net worth individual today. So if you're then hired for a mandate Maybe they've acquired a team or they're working through a transition to the next generation. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Does your work fit into one easy sweet spot? I'm guessing the answer is no, but maybe talk about the majority of your mandates. (laughs) The kind of classic call that I get is our annual meeting is next month and we need you to brush up our people so that we can do a better job in communicating what we're doing to our investors. And that can be a wealth manager or an institution. It's largely an institution with annual meetings. And then the second call I often get is the head of investor relations or marketing for whatever firm who says, my portfolio manager is blowing up my deals. You need to come fix him. It's usually him. And there, my success, my results are based on my ability to, to talk to a portfolio manager in language in which they understand and will find credible. So I can't do what they do, but I understand what they do. And I understand what they need to do to communicate that in a way to their institutional client, to their high net worth client, to their retail client, the wholesale part of that. And that's why I went back to school, Bill, after my MBA and got another master's in organizational psychology and change, (laughs) a little counseling psychology there so people can hear me when I coach them couple things. One, if you go in, you can't and don't want to change an investment process or philosophy. Maybe you have to understand that. This is a problem. I mean, one of the things that my work has done and will do is point up all the warts. So if I'm working with an investment team that is not on the same page, that will come out in a heartbeat. And I have had that situation where I was coaching what is now one of the largest money managers in the world around how they had at the time just maybe a handful of people who could tell the full story. So we were trying to bring that down a level and it was clear that the investment team was not the same page. So we had to stop that project and help them get on the same page. And that involved the investment process. So it does show the warts, but no, generally I am not the person who's going to be adding value on here's what your investment process should be. I'm going to add value on how are you explaining this investment process and why doesn't it make any sense to me? Now, are there situations where the process is either inconsistent or so complex that no matter how talented you are, it's just not a mandate you can take on because some things in life just are not fixable? (laughs) 
I haven't had that occasion. And I have done some black box, real quantitative work with those kinds of strategies. But what more often, and it doesn't happen that often, but there are portfolio managers who just aren't necessarily going to be great in front of an investor. And that is the task. And I usually can fix that, but not every single time. The world is not perfect. And then we have to make a different decision. And also in the fixing, because I've been in this industry a long time too, Jane, and I see that many times your most talented investment professional, it's not that they're not so good, they're horrible, horrible yeah. at telling the story. Yeah. I have so many friends who are at allocators, mostly endowments and foundations, but some of the public funds who call me up and say, can you please talk to this person and fix them? Because they just did a meeting and it was horrendous. <laughs> so it's widely recognized. It's almost I don't know, for a while there, it was becoming almost a badge of honor, <laughs> like the worse you were, the more talented investment manager you were, which of course is ridiculous. But I think that the people who select those roles, Bill, are wired differently. People say all the time, well, what's the secret? What's the one thing? What's the biggest mistake you see a portfolio manager make? And the biggest mistake I see them make is they walk into a meeting and they don't care about what the other person's thinking, feeling, doing, believing. They're not interested in others. And some would argue that that's what it takes to do what they do. They have to be so focused and in their heads about their own portfolios and their strategy and what they're doing that thinking about anything else than that is not productive. I would argue that's not necessarily true, but some argue that it is. And so I do think you run into that. And what I try to do is raise their awareness around, here's what's in it for you to do it the way I'm suggesting. And I wonder though, is there a role for an intermediary, and not the way you and I would think about that in our industry, but maybe if I explain it from an experience I had, one of my most important mentors who's going to be a guest on this platform in a few weeks, he once said to me, it's one of the highest compliments ever paid to me, that I can explain the unexplainable. So I, I can that. never go and run a portfolio. And I was never really a client service person, although maybe I should have tried that myself. But being able to say, okay, you're never going to understand, and as, as you said, it's probably a man, this crazy man behind the curtain who's so smart, but let me explain the unexplainable to you, and let me explain the investment process, and if you need to know the other 20%, you can have access to him, but it's sometimes the answer that that person is just so smart, but so wired in an inward way in running the algorithm or running the portfolio that you need somebody else to tell the story. Well, I think that's why we have what a lot of firms call portfolio specialists. The role varies from firm to firm, but I think that role is generally the translator, the person who gets what's going on in the portfolio, but also gets the importance of the individual decision maker, be they a wealthy person or an institutional allocator, that they need to understand it too. I think there's a meeting of the minds here. I mean, I remember when allocators were all demanding to see the hedge fund portfolio, the underlying portfolio, and they want to see all the trades and the activities. And they, and it was all about transparency. And they had to see uh, when they, they wanted to see the whole short book and the whole thing. And we all were sitting there saying, why? What are you going to do with that data? What are you going to do with that information? So I do think there's a happy medium here when it comes to transparency. But yeah, I do think that's why we've had, and I think it's been over the last 10 years, the growth in this portfolio specialist role that serves to translate what's going on in the portfolio. It also leverages the person behind the curtain, as you call it, so that they're not having to do so much of that work, whether or not they're good at it. Trying to leverage those people is important, but I think that's the role of the portfolio specialist. Don't you think? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And maybe a corollary observation too about key person risk and maybe made to keep this on point key man risk because that's still an operative term, I think. <laughs> So oftentimes you get the story told, but having a key man in a position like this can be dangerous because either they could leave, decide to not show up for work, they could retire. A star is a star. And if they're an alpha producer, you want them doing that. But the more you could build teams around these people, I think the more you have a successful business, not only for the manager, but for the client as well, because there's at least some form of transition. With a superstar, it's hard. But how do you see our industry striking that balance around the alpha superstar, the alpha warrior, versus trying to make that skill into a generational transferability quotient, which I think is very, very hard to do, but maybe not impossible. Well, and the data's 
on your side there. I mean, we haven't, and at least in the hedge fund business, we haven't done that very well as an industry. But I think it's a leadership question. I mean, if you think about what are the most important roles or the important job of a leader, why do leaders fail? And they fail to build a team is usually the problem or there's some sort of toxic leadership issue, but generally they fail to build a team. And so I do think it's a leadership issue. And I think that what I'm seeing with my clients is a fair amount of success in building teams and being able to help people see where their strengths are and really put the resources behind the strengths and let them go and let them do their thing. And I feel like we're, as an industry, and we, there's a whole different conversation, which might require some beer, but I feel like that's the really interesting thing about what's going on in industry is that leadership now matters. And for years, I mean, you remember, for years, management skills, leadership skills, they were all at a premium. And in some institutions, they still are, but I feel like that's really changed a lot. Maybe because many of these asset management firms have become public companies, and that's a whole different strategy now in terms of how they have to lead. But I do think it's changed. And so do I have a great secret sauce and formula for helping leverage a superstar? No, I don't. I think that depends on the culture of the institution that you're dealing with and just the people inside. But I do think that leadership is getting better at figuring out how to match skills to roles. And that's exciting to me. Yeah, I agree. And I think maybe if we look at a lot of the trades out there, they have a pretty structured and organized apprentice-based system. And maybe stealing a page from that, where if you had somebody who's very, very good and they're in the 40s or 50s, just attach a team of young, eager people willing to learn, willing to be active listeners, and see if one or two of them could maybe acquire some of those skills. And I don't think we do enough about that because we focus on a star system and you know, off we go. And, and I think maybe turning the page a little bit, maybe that brings in some of the challenges around where we are. And let's just maybe keep it with gender diversity because there are issues across the board, but I know that's been more your passion as a woman. Still a lot of work to be done there, but what is the current state of play Maybe using today, but maybe early on in your career as a benchmark, I think progress has been made, but Absolutely. But at what kind of pace? Snails pace. I mean, we're still looking at numbers of women running the investment function of significant Wall Street firms, negligible. Women running capital, still really low numbers. Women being able to attract capital, still really low numbers. I mean, we're working on it. And I feel like we're at a moment in time where there's much more emphasis. And that's great. That's great. And organizations like 100 Women in Finance, and there's an organization called Women in Funds that you may not know. It's a relatively new organization that was started by Laura Schneid. That's really an interesting one. There are organizations of women that are supported by women and men, because I think that's a key component of this. This is not an adversarial thing. It's really a collaborative effort that we have to make together. I used to be the only woman at the investment table back in the day. And that's obviously changed a lot. And that's great. Women really controlling significant pools of capital is still really low. And the percentage of that is really low. And I think we've got work to do. We've still got work to do. And even with the University of Delaware club that you and I advise, one of the things I think kind of woke them up is when I pointed out to the leaders of that very new organization that they were kind of reflecting the private equity business in the fact that they had so few women as members of their club. And they didn't really see it until I pointed it out. And they said, that's a problem. We got to fix it. And they have, they, well, they're working on it. They have the challenge of leadership changing every three years or so as their seniors graduate. But I guess the point I'm trying to make there is like everything else, we have to start younger and start helping young people see it and be able to try and help them make change. I agree with all that. And I do know 100 Women in Finance. I knew them when they're 100 Women in Hedge Funds. And uh, Jane Buchan, who is the chair of our board and important mentor and friend of mine today and into the future. And a real leader in this space. Yes. She's just awesome, pragmatic, very, very smart, and got to where she was as a smart professional. In fact, she's a woman, is helpful to both the cause and the issue at hand. 
But I do wonder, and maybe this is my ignorance, Jane, with some of these organizations, I know Invest in Girls less so, but do we need to have either more male representation on these boards or more interaction with senior men in this industry? Because we have a responsibility and we need to be a partner and we can influence outcomes. But if we just say, hey, it's great to know that 100 Women in Finance is on the case and they hope they succeed... I don't know if that's good enough. And maybe they do have more diverse board representation. But I think if we isolate the problem over here in certain organizations, is that almost going to be an impediment to solving it to some degree? I think that's right. I remember having a conversation at least 10 years ago with a relatively new head of talent at one of the big money management firms. And I was pointing out some of the issues around women in the firm as well as women in the industry. And she basically shut me down and said, I don't want to be the woman, the issue. I don't want to be tagged with that. Well, that's changed a lot. I think that was probably the right call for her at the time, but I think that's changed a lot. We still have mostly men running these firms, but they have wives and daughters who they have to go home to at night who are pointing these things out. And I think that that's changing. I know I know, 100 Women in Finance has several men on their board, but the same recognition, it's a collaborative effort. It's not an adversarial thing. We're not going to make any progress. We didn't make any progress or not much when we were sort of being adversarial with men. And I think that that's something that we've all understood and learned over the last several years. And absolutely, we have to collaborate with men for this. Investing Girls is a not-for-profit. It's a program of the Council for Economic Education, where their mandate is financial and economic literacy. In the United States, that's what we're trying to do there. And the program on investing girls, we recognize that we had to start younger with girls. Once girls get into even high school, if they haven't done the math and the science and the technology, you know, the step type programs, by the time to get to college, they're already behind the eight ball for jobs on Wall Street and other types of more technical financial and otherwise jobs. And so we've learned all that. And we have some very strong and committed men on the board of CEE, but all on the committee for the Investing Girls program. And I think that's true in other organizations as well. And as I look at this next turn of the screw in our industry, chat GPT is all the rage, generative AI, and it's not just being a very good analyst. There's going to be need for engineers and math skills, computer scientists. And I think we have more diversity in some of those classrooms and some of those industries. So Maybe that helps. I don't know what your view is there. I think it absolutely helps. And what's encouraging to see is we do see some improvement in the numbers of young women going into those fields and into the study to predate some of them entering those fields. And that's great. As many as we'd like, maybe not. Are we getting more women in the private markets club in the University of Delaware? Yes. Enough? No. The cop out here, Bill, is it's a process. I'd just like to see it happen faster. I mean, I can't believe I'm sitting here having this conversation with you after as many years as both of us have spent in the industry, and we're still having the conversation. Yeah. And I think the ultimate goal is to put DEI out of business because it's exactly. Like Can we stop having this conversation because we don't need to. I mean, that's a little bit negative. That's just not really my personality, but that is where we are. And we've had these conversations with other guests on this platform that. We're a great industry, but we're not a profession. And I think if you can go into the classroom, not only financial literacy, but talk to law students and medical students, I think there we've done a much better job, probably still work to be done there too. But I think we see more diverse professionals in those industries because they are professions. For us, there's no such thing as a major in money management. I'd like to think that COVID also has contributed a little bit because it's the woman typically that's home with the kids or taking care of the aging parent. And, and a five-day work week has been more of a challenge. But if we could allow some continued flexibility, because most of these asset management firms did quite well through COVID when everybody was sitting at home. And, and maybe there are some tools around Zoom or remote working that we can continue to utilize into the future to get more people actively involved in this industry. Yeah, and I think that's also not just about gender. I just think that's about evolution, broadly speaking. I think that flexibility for humans is a good thing and some would argue a required thing. And yeah, if we can help women in particular and other people who need that flexibility, it's about 
harnessing talent. How do we harness talent in a way that we need to, where we can be useful? I think that that's important. And it does seem to me that the flexibility piece, people are really getting that. And maybe that's about an age factor and the fact that we're trying to attract younger talent and the younger talent is requiring the flexibility and being able to work from home. And maybe people got spoiled through COVID because they could work from home, whatever the reason. I think it's a good thing. And I think it's here to stay. The challenge is how do we continue to manage culture and evolve our culture, maintain our cultures when people are not getting together physically? It can be done, but it's a challenge. It is a challenge. And I wonder about your book of business at Percival Jane and that if you had a competitor that showed up before COVID and said, Jane, I'm going to mimic your business model. The only catch is I'm going to do everything remote. I think you would have said, good luck trying. I'll see you on the unemployment line. But then COVID hit. And I would imagine all of your business was done remotely for a period of time, as all of us did. But then coming out of the other side, do you continue to do some portion of your business remote? I think there's probably some special cases of people that you really just need to be with them uh, because they need that kind of coaching and active listening can only be done so much when you're looking at screens, et cetera, your desktop. But have some of these tools that you learn to use effectively during COVID, have some of those stayed with your practice? Absolutely. In March of 2020, I had the most crazy calendar for the rest of 2020 that I'd had maybe ever. And it, of course, all shut down. And I thought, oh, I think I just got early retired. <laughs> Honestly, that's what I thought. I thought, well, I'm done. And my business has come back stronger than ever. And I'm likely the most surprised about that because I thought that I had to be there. And what's been so interesting about the work that I do on Zoom is some of it's been even more effective than in person. And I think it's because people are able to be a little more vulnerable. When I'm doing Zoom meetings, my clients are usually at home. Sometimes in the office, it's usually they're at home. And I think there's an ability for them to be a little more vulnerable. So my laser coaching style is even more effective. I do a lot of work with my private equity managers, portfolio companies, CEOs, and C-suite teams. And those people, depending on the industry, tend to want to meet in person. And it's fine. I do it. <laughs> I didn't realize that portion of it, working with some of the private equity CEOs, kind of interesting. So in that case, is the GP, the investor, the person hiring you? Or is it the portfolio company? Yeah. It's usually in advance of the sales process. Okay. If they're selling the company or just preparing for that. But yes, I do. That's been so much fun because there's so many different industries that I'm exposed to as a result of that. So while I consider myself a consultant in the asset management space, I've done work in all kinds of industries, shipping, telecom, food, food management, grocery store, all kinds of things. And it's been really, really interesting and helpful for my own growth. And I learned this just having come back from the Middle East where I spent the last week. And certainly Saudi has this vision 2030 where in the next seven years, they want to rid the economy of oil dependency. So they're very actively trying to build a diverse ecosystem of many, many things unrelated to oil. And when I thought of an entrepreneur, I always thought it was a choice. It's not always a choice. It's sometimes a necessity, particularly if you have an economy in transition. But back to the observation you just made about these portfolio companies, capital formation of value creation is happening more and more in the private markets. More and more people are entrepreneurs. They're entrepreneurs at a very young age, and they could be very good at one or two things. But if it's a private company, is speaking to shareholders and talking about their business model to a room full of strangers is not something they, A, have done, and B, probably doesn't come naturally to almost all of them. So I think it's an interesting point. It's an entrepreneurial mindset where you're so focused on you and your agenda and what you're trying to do, and you're not focused on the other person, whomever it is sitting across the table. And that's where the work has to start. Yep, I agree. So as we wind this up, Jane, maybe any closing observations from you? We just figured out we'd never met, but I feel like I've known you a good long time. And two things I really admire about you, there's always the next chapter, no matter where you are in your career, but you also have made a career of giving back and getting invested in this next generation. And I think 
all of us can learn a lot from you because does it take time? Yes. But is the time well spent? Yes to that too, with an exclamation point. So, so thank you for all of that. I think there's going to be many people that are going to benefit that might not even realize you were behind it directly. They may not have a chance to say thank you. So I'll do it on their behalf. And right back at you, Bill. Yeah, I think that that's the takeaway. If we could really focus on younger people and helping them see what's possible in finance, that would be good, but almost anywhere, just helping them see what's possible. That I think is not just something I want to do. It's an obligation, I think. And you do a fair amount of it yourself. So thank you for that. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for joining me today. Great to see you, Jane. Such a great pleasure. Thanks so much, Bill. Thank you for listening to Educational Alpha. I'm your host, Bill Kelly. Learn more about the Kaya Association and subscribe to the show at kaya.org. That's C-A-I-A.org. See you next time. Mm-hmm.